This talk is part of our uh, department seminar, and it also doubles as the keynote for the workshop we're doing downstairs, which is called Datafication and Community Activism. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Uriel Serrano, who um, is a sociologist and youth worker. He's been in the department here um, as a postdoc working in the Invoke Lab for a year and a half. Um, he earned his PhD in sociology and critical race and ethnic studies from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, he is studying carcerality and how carcerality seeps across social context and also how Black and Latinx communities respond. So this research includes topics in youth, policing, and emotion, gender ideologies, criminalization, and the routines, rules, and relations of organizations. Oops, thanks, Mishu. Like school, uh, like school boards and universities. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sadam. How y'all doing? Good. Good. Good to see y'all. Um, well, it's my absolute pleasure, honor, our privilege to introduce. The homie, oh well, Professor Dr. Davis, he turned in. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm gonna give you the, the 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 very professional bio, and then I'm gonna kind of speak from the heart a little bit. Um, so Dr. Davis C. Turner the third is a senior advisor at the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, working with the team to develop internal infrastructure and on campaigns to uplift community schools, transform school discipline, and decriminalize youth and communities of color. Um, Dr. Turner was a partner with the Alliance um, as a manager of uh, as a manager of the Brothers on Selves Coalition in Los Angeles. And he's also part of inaugural uh, uh, fellows of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color Data Fellowship, um, where he worked with the Tableau, uh, Tableau Foundation. Um, but he also worked as a staff member uh, with the Social Justice Learning Institute in Inglewood, uh, which is his hometown. Dr. Turner holds a PhD in education from UC Berkeley, a master's in education from the University of Pennsylvania, and a BA in Africana Studies from uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Um, currently, he also holds an appointment with the Department of Social Welfare uh, at UCLA as an assistant professor of Black life and racial justice um, at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. And so his research broadly focuses on youth-based social movements, political identity and resistance to the prison, pre prison regime, um, where he examines the ways that Black boys and young men work to resist the carceral landscape alongside their peers and community-based educational spaces. And he's published numerous articles and book chapters and received, like I already kind of mentioned, right, several fellowships and awards, right? And he also brings over a decade of movement building experiences as a youth worker, as a political education and research space specialist. And this is where I'm going to kind of stop and just speak a little bit from the heart, right, because um, I've had the honor and privilege to not only work with Dr. Turner, he's my interlocutor, co conspirator fellow youth worker, um, but I've also had the honor in the last five years to witness the transformative potential of who he is, what he brings to the movement, and what he offers young people, right? Where I've seen firsthand um, young people um, find what Bill Hooks calls a home place in Dr. Turner, right? That he's not just a place of political education and resistance, but he's also a place of love. And I'm calling you a place, it sounds weird, right? But <laughs> um, a place of love, nurturing, uh, um, and affirmation for these young folks, right? Where he centers their experiences, their voices, what they want, their demands, and their visions to inform his research, his practice, how he moves in the world, um, and just an overall, loving person to be around. So with that, um, welcome Dr. David Turner III. Let's go, appreciate you. Oh boy, Dr. Serrano, man. Uh, I mean, I know, uh, you know, everybody in the rap game is not popular, but uh, um, there's that one song, Dreams and Nightmares, and folks you say, to pray for times like this, right? You know, uh, where me and a homie was uh, struggling through grad school, trying to um, get through our dissertations and still organizing in the streets and having to give young people rides home and stuff. And here we are, like postdocs and professors and stuff and still in the work. It's pretty crazy, but, you know, we outside. We outside. All right, so um, today's talk is titled Schools Not Prisons, Participatory Action Research Notes from the Abolitionist Movement to Reimagine Public Safety in Los Angeles, right? Now, I'm gonna tell y'all straight up, right, that 
as somebody who got an entire PhD in education, schools are trash, right? Um, just straight up, right? <laughs> I, I, I just want to go ahead and just get that out the way. Um, but the phrase schools not prisons is not imagined here as um, the schools that we currently have, right? But for their discursive meanings for what it is that communities want to build in terms of life affirming and life sustaining institutions, right? Um, so we're not talking about the, the type of schools where we're trying to imagine or trying to engage, um, you know, the typical banking model of education and all that, right? So I want to I want to name that up front, right? You know, because I know you're gonna see the title and be like, wait, what? Um, you really want more banking and more just all the problematic things that happen in schools? No, just want to be clear. So um, we're gonna kind of start off. I'll start off with a positionality statement, right? You know, just so y'all know a little bit more about me. Um, talk a little bit about reorienting action research, right? So what it means to me and how, um, you know, I've gone about it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about carceral common sense, right? Um, and what carceral common sense has done um, to essentially animate, right, the growth um, and continued investment, right, in the larger prison regime and prison infrastructure here in California, more broadly in Los Angeles specifically, right? Uh, from that point, we're going to talk a little bit about some campaign strategies um, that people have adopted to combat carceral common sense. And then what are some examples, right? Because, you know, it's not enough for us to just theorize and talk about this. Now we got to put in some real work. Right. So what are some examples from the field and then what can we learn, you know, from abolitionist movements today? So first and foremost, um, a lot of people will tell you that uh, and uh, well, when I say a lot of people, I mean, allegedly the academy, all those mm -hmm. folks. Right. They'll say, oh, you need to be objective and an objective researcher. Um, that's not me. <laughs> um, you got to go find somebody else because. Uh, um, like uh, James Baldwin would say, I am not your Negro, right? <laughs> um, so I have been absolutely engaged um, directly as an organizer, uh, working to build power, right, with folks in my community, right? I'm the only member of my immediate family to not be incarcerated, you know? So um, literally, right, uh, I've witnessed and seen the violence that the state can enact on communities. And for the longest time, I thought that was normal, right? Um, it wasn't until, right, like I um, was lucky enough to have a really strong high school um, high school English teacher um, who put me on game where I realized that what I was experiencing was not by mistake, but it was by design, mm -hmm. right? So um, with that, I wanted to do something about it, right? It wasn't enough to just learn and do, you know, just read the books and the theory, no, nah, we had to change these conditions. So um, this led me to become a community organizer, educator, and a youth worker, right? Um, in my own community back in Inglewood, California is where I got my start. Uh, from that point, um, I began to be influenced by abolition, right? Or abolitionist ideas. Um, this comes from my participation in the larger movement for Black Lives um, since the murder of Trayvon Martin. Right, so for the last, damn, 11 years. Wow, getting old, right? Um, so for the last 11 years, you know, I've been um, engaged in work, right? Rooted in abolition that's been influenced by the black radical tradition. I study um, black youth organizing their resistance to dispossession and dehumanization. Um, and I also take an interdisciplinary approach, right? You know, so I got my PhD in education. I was trained by a political scientist. I do ethnic studies type work. I'm in a department of social welfare. Y'all like, damn, how many different disciplines are there? All, all of them, right? <laughs> so, um, so again, so I draw upon um, literature frameworks and ideas from community psychology, um, ethnic studies, black studies in particular, um, sociology, um, uh, political science, all of these different things to help inform how it is I see the world, right? And because I know people are always interested in, well, what are your methods? How do you actually do the work that you do, right? Um, today's presentation is going to be rooted in 
um, in some particular ideas, right? Or in some rooted empirical evidence, right? Based on my years of experience. So um, the data you're gonna see and the information is coming from nine years or about 13,000 hours of participant observation as an organizer. Um, for having the anthropologists or anthropologists leaning folks in the room, you know, that's a lot of time. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I'm organizing my field notes, pray for me. Um, this is also connected to, you'll also see data from a larger interview project connected to 68 interviews for over 140 hours of interview data. Um, I've been a part of five major participatory action research projects that have resulted in over 34,000 surveys collected um, across the landscape, right? So this mainly is young people, as well as other community members, engaged voters, um, and others about how they want to invest public dollars, how they want to reimagine public safety, and most importantly, um, how it is that they see their own cities and communities, right? And I've been a part of three state level, two county level, two city level, and five school district level campaigns. Right. Um, all of these campaigns being successful in their ultimate aims of transforming whatever condition they would set out to transform, whether that is eliminating willful defiant school suspension so that way kids don't get suspended for hats and chewing gum, or if that is defunding school police and taking that money to reinvest in Black student achievement. Yeah, to be clear, we took cop money and gave it to Black people. <laughs> right. So, um, with that being said, Right, that's what this project is rooted in. You know, that's what um, this presentation is rooted in, right? So um, if there are some folks, especially I know this is gonna be on YouTube who wanna come for me, well, check it <laughs> in, right? All right, so first we gotta dive into um, participatory action research, right? So I know some of you or a lot of you may have heard of participatory action research and a little bit what it is, but I like to kind of break it down and contextualize things. So that way we all have a shared understanding or at least a shared analysis of where things come from. So a lot of it starts off with epistemology, right? Um, this is a really fancy word for saying how we come to know things, right? So our epistemologies are deeply informed by the institutions we interact with, the media we consume, the social media we consume, the relationships that we have, and all of the things that help inform how it is we come to know about the world, how it is we come to know the things that we know, right? So knowledge, right, and how we understand that knowledge is critical for being able to understand and engage research, right? So when we talk about this thing called research, right? Research has been and continues to be a systemic investigation into the phenomenon of the everyday world, right? So, hey, you know, there um, are people who like Sprite versus Coca-Cola. Why do they do that, right? Um, <laughs> again, systemic investigation into the phenomenon of the everyday world, right? Now, some of it isn't as frivolous as you know, people liking different Coca-Cola products, right? Some of it is a little bit more serious, um, where we may be looking at suspension rates in schools or where, where people may be looking at um, how sexual violence impacts certain communities, right? So it can get really serious and it is very serious. Um, and the production of ideas, right, really helps us to be able to name how things are happening in the world. Now, the problem, is that for the longest, research has been used as a vehicle to harm communities of color, right? The production of knowledge itself has been used to justify the harsh things that happen in communities. It, is, it has been and continues to be a project of colonialism, right? To be clear. So with that being said, what does that actually look like? Um, there's this cat up here, Daniel Moynihan, the Negro Family Report. If you've ever heard the stereotype of absent Black fathers, raise your hand, right? Now, a lot of people, you know, they have heard that stereotype, but again, that stereotype was animated, right, through research 
this research right here by this cat, Dan Moynihan, at the time, um, a presidential appointee to study the Negro problem, um, where he ultimately asserts that it is absent Black fathers and the dysfunctional families, right, this, especially Black women, right, that are the problem in the Black community. Now, the interesting thing about this report is that it comes out in 1965, the year before what happens the Civil Rights Act. So he wrote this report saying, well, the reason Black people can't get their shit together, even though they just got rights 15 minutes ago, <laughs> is because they ain't got no daddies. Right? Now, we talk about that report, but what were the ramifications of this? Right? What were the ramifications of using research by this alleged legitimate authority. And what did that do? Well, it fueled continued practices of pathologizing Black communities, right? And again, this is just one minor example. There are people who have written entire anthologies about the history of racist ideas and all that other stuff, right? So this is one minor example. But I bring this point up in particular to demonstrate the ways how research in and of itself has been used as a vehicle to harm communities of color. Now, why do we do participatory action research? There are essentially three things, right, are three primary reasons why we engage in participatory action research. First and foremost, we use action research as a vehicle to combat the neoliberal policies and practices that help to perpetuate blame the victim narratives, right? Now, I'm assuming folks have heard of the term neoliberalism before, right? Um, you know, sometimes it could be really easy to define, other times it isn't, because um, it's kind of everything, right? It's like the matrix and shit. Um, so when we talk about right, these neoliberal policies, right, or these neoliberal practices that help to perpetuate these blame the victim narratives, right, I'll give you a quick example. I went to a school in the Inglewood Unified School District called Morningside High School, right? Um, if you are familiar with basketball, right, that's the same school where people like Lisa Leslie and Eldon Campbell and Byron Scott, um, that's where they all went in the city of Inglewood. That is... My school, Morningside High School, is one of five schools to be slated to be closed at the end of the 2024-2025 year, right? Now, when we talk about these neoliberal policies and practices that perpetuate the blame the victim narrative, the central idea, right, that of the reason why these schools are closing is, well, kid, parents don't send their kids to these schools, therefore we have to close them. Never mind the fact that the school district is in a $37 million deficit from a loan they took out from the state. Never mind the fact that the community hasn't had autonomy, right, to be able to manage and govern its own district because it's been in state receivership. Never mind the fact that community organizations that were partnering with the district that were bringing the students in, right, have been subsequently kicked out of the district. Never mind any of that. We're going to perpetuate the narrative that is your fault for not sending your kids here. Right. So to clarify that neoliberal policies and practices that perpetuate blame the victim narratives, that's what it looks like. Right. Second is the lack of consideration of the suffering of oppressed people. Right. Essentially saying that all oppression is not real or valid. So this right looks like, well, you know, those um, those black folks, I mean, if they just talk to cops nicer then things will be okay, right? Or, well, you know, what's happening with those uh, immigrants, if they just tried to come to the United States the right way, then this wouldn't be a problem. Never mind people waiting on their citizenship for 20 years because uh, we have a horrible, horrible, horrible system, right, uh, that actually grants people citizenship. I mean, I was recently in Europe and literally getting off the plane just to get to where I was going in Amsterdam was a 15 minute process. If you have ever traveled out the country and then traveled back into the country, 
you know, going back through uh, customs and border control is terrible. I'm like, yo, I live 15 minutes from the airport. Why is it taking me an hour and a half just to get the hell out of here? <laughs> right? But again, uh, when we talk about right not considering the suffering of folks real or valid, right? Like that's what it's rooted in. And third, it's purposeful social isolation created and maintained through decades of marginalization and discrimination, right? So one of the things about action research is that it works to combat this social isolation, right? I'll give you a quick anecdote, then we're going to move on. Uh, one of the young people I work with, right, his name is Sean Jones. Um, Sean did an action research project, um, him and his uh, classmates, around um, teachers and student-teacher relationships. And one of the things that they found was that it was Black students that had a harsher critique of the school, essentially suggesting that the school operated and felt like a prison um, because of how Black students were treated. Now, Sean, in an interview, right, said to me that I didn't realize that other people felt like that too, right? Action research helped him to understand that, hey, it's not just me that's experiencing this. This is us, right? Data is that collective story that we tell together, right? So that's how he was able to mobilize action research to create a change in his school. So we do participatory action research to address these things. So what are some components of participatory action research? First and foremost, you pose problems in the community, right? So what are the issues? After we do that, we conduct research about these issues, and then we identify solutions and launch campaigns and build power, right? So doing the research alone is cool, right? But no, it's not just about that, right? It's about how do we then create a campaign around this so that we can build power and transform a material condition, right? Um, that's the, these are the components of participatory action research, right? So real quick, the ex execution of research in collaboration with empathic communities seeking change um, through that research. This process necessitates a belief that empathic communities have intimate knowledge about their conditions and that they can transform them with good partnership. It is fundamentally about changing a transformative or, or changing a structural condition, right? So when we talk about action research, right? Again, central component, main component is that you got to do it with the people who you actually are working with, right? It's not just about pulling up and saying, hey, y'all, I got all the answers, come follow me, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, it's about how do we work with those folks who have actually been impacted by these issues in order to transform conditions, right? So that, right, is the sort of central idea of action research. Now, I want to get to this piece on um, problem solving versus problem posing, right? Now, I know we oftentimes teach in schools that, you know, we gotta try to solve problems or we gotta solve the world's most pressing issues. I'm sure that's in everybody's university advertisement, right? Um, you ever seen those, welcome to UC Irvine videos, right? Um, or welcome to whatever university in, in the world, um, it will say something about we are here to solve problems, right? Now, problem solving questions tend to look like this, right? Well, there seems to be a problem between police and communities of color, especially these black folks. How do we improve police community relations with people of color, right? What can make boys of color behave better in schools? I mean, how do we ensure that these young people are actually doing the work to behave in schools, right? Or to have a more positive school climate? Third, how do we help women protect themselves from sexual assault as if the assault is just happening and it's not happening from people, right? Particularly men. So problem posing questions were to identify a power dynamic or a power relationship, right? It's important 
that we identify a power relationship because folks aren't just, these conditions are not static. There is a relationship of power there in any impacted community for whatever issue you're doing action research around, right? There will absolutely be a power relationship. So the questions we have must in some way interrogate those relationships of power, right? Again, research is oftentimes rooted around research questions. But if we're asking the wrong questions, what kind of data are we going to get? Then what kind of campaigns are we going to build? Because the campaign that you build, right, around how do we improve police community relations with people of color, well, you're going to start doing a whole lot of police and community dialogues, right? That's going to be the campaign, The uh, what they call it, coffee with a cop, right? <laughs> That type of shit. <laughs> but when we start asking questions like, well, why do people of color distrust the police? And we begin to see patterns of discrimination or where we see like what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, where there was not only explicit patterns of discrimination, but they were using poor black folks right, to keep their department afloat by overcharging them in fines and fees, and they counted on that in their annual budgets, then we start to see something a little different, right? But it all depends on the questions we're asking, right? Instead of saying, what can make boys of color behave better in schools? Well, you know, maybe we should start rapping in class, right? You know, like... <laughs> I mean, I mean, maybe, right? But <laughs> what type of social climate are boys of color responding to in their classes and on their campuses, right? I have sat there and watched with my own eyes, right? Especially before I had glasses, you know, what? but I could see. <laughs> um, I watched with my own eyes, right? Where adults would be mediators and will break students apart from fights and will work to calm situations down and will work to even mediate situations. And then after the mediation happened, a school police officer comes and still does arrest. Right? So again, what type of climate are young people responding to? Finally, what prevents women from being safe? And how can we change that? So again, I'm a part of the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color. And one of the things that we do is we not only work to facilitate domestic violence trainings, but also too, um, we work with other organizations like A Call to Men and other folks around conscious and courageous conversations around domestic violence and interpersonal violence, right? So if we know that disproportionately, right, it's a certain group of folks who are engaged and involved in this type of work, then well, maybe we work with that group of folks to prevent these type, these type of violent interactions in the first place. Maybe we start there, right? And then how about we work to build systems of accountability and support that don't over-rely on punishment and instead focus on healing and rehabilitation, right? So the conditions and the answers and the campaigns, right, that we launch look fundamentally different. Because if we just take this at face value, right, we got a whole bunch of, we got, we'll have a whole bunch of women and femme identify folks in karate classes. <laughs> but that doesn't stop the assaulting. So again, right, problem posing versus problem solving. Understanding that there is a, that there is a power dynamic. And finally, when we talk about action research, I wanted to bring up this piece that uh, me and uh, Uriel um, actually co-authored, right? There is a need and a particular desire, right, to move away just from community-engaged scholarship to community-rooted scholarship. It's a fundamental difference, right? And this is the difference that we had worked to articulate in one of the pieces that we wrote together, right? When we talk about community-engaged scholarship, this is oftentimes driven by the university with some community input, right? You know, it sounds kind of cool, you know? where, yeah, you know, you get one really hip radical professor um, who wants to go into communities and go do some racial justice work, right? And they'll get community organizations, yeah, we'll do it, right, to come be a part of it. But the university partner ultimately decides how the project moves forward. 
when we talk about assets and agency, it's typically centered on an asset-based understanding, right? So that communities have knowledge um, to contribute to solve complex problems. And then finally, it is race conscious, right? So community-engaged scholarship oftentimes, right, makes explicit commitments to understanding root causes of inequalities um, and disparities created by white supremacy and all these other things, right? But community-rooted research and practice is a little different, right? Mm -hmm. This is driven by community with university training and tools. So the community members lead and determine um, the direction while university partners provide access, tools, and training, and that's it, right? So when, we, when he talks about partnerships, right, community members are the ones in, in control. Second, it's centered in an agency-based understanding. Now, having an asset-based understanding, an agency-based understanding, they sound similar, but they're not, right? An asset-based understanding is, hey, you know, I see that you are a Black person. You have value, right? An agency-based understanding is, no, you not only just have value, but you have, you have the tools and everything you need to change your conditions. Let's work together to make that happen. It's not just about seeing people for the assets they bring. It's about making sure that we can build power together because that's where organizing happens. Communities have both the tools and power to radically transform relationships of power and complex social relationships. And then finally, right, community rooted research and practice is abolitionist, right? So it makes an explicit commitment to abolishing systems that uphold white supremacy while building institutions that are rooted in care, health, and the preservation of the lives of Black, Black folks, Indigenous folks, and other communities of color. Right. So when we talk about action research and we talk about what action research entails, right, these are some of the larger commitments that you should be thinking about. Now we do this to fight organized abandonment. Some of you may or may not have heard this word before, um, or this phrase. It comes from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, right, an abolitionist geographer. She says, in the United States, where organized abandonment has happened throughout the country, we see that people have lost the ability to keep their individual selves, their household, and their communities together with adequate income, clean water, reasonable air, reliable shelter, and transportation and communication infrastructure. What has risen up in the crevices of this cracked foundation of security has been policing and prison. So in the type of communities where I organize or where, you know, I may frequent or be connected to or a part of, we're facing the conditions of organized abandonment. We're facing the conditions, right, of our communities essentially being left not only to their own devices, but also to, right, where all of the positive things in our communities get uprooted while what's left and what's invested in are carceral technologies of control, right? So what animates this, right? Well, first and foremost, you have to manufacture consent to be able to invest in only solutions to control communities and not solutions to support them, right? So how do you actually manufacture consent? What is that manufacturing of consent? So where it becomes popular to say, well, we need to invest in cops. What does that look like? I'll give you two quick examples. Y'all know who this is. The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. The fourth challenge is to take back our streets from crime, gangs, and drugs. And we have actually been making progress on this count as a nation because of what local law enforcement officials are doing, because of what citizens and neighborhood patrols are doing, we're making some progress. Much of it is related to the initiative called community policing, because we have finally gotten more police officers on the street. That was one of the goals that the president had when he pushed the crime bill that was passed in 1994. He promised 100,000 police. We're moving in that direction, but we can see it already makes a difference because if we have more police interacting with people, having them on the streets, we can prevent crimes. We can prevent petty crimes from turning into something worse. 
But we also have to have an organized effort against gangs. Just as in a previous generation, we had an organized effort against the mob. We need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. And the president has asked the FBI to launch a very concerted effort against gangs everywhere. Hey, right? Again, manufacturing consent. Now, where did Hillary Clinton get this word super predators? Hmm? Probably academic research. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we, don't we got all these cell phones and technology? And all that? <laughs> hey, look, I'm a critical educator. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Where's it come from? Super, this is Google super predator origin. Super predator word origin. I hope the movie Predator doesn't come up. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> oh. 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 Oh, so, uh, well, political scientist Annabelle, Annabelle didn't dim your people. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but remember when I said that research is oftentimes used as a vehicle for oppression, right? And this professor who is an Ivy League professor, right, um, has created official knowledge about the world. And then that official knowledge right, gets used by the, at the time, the first lady of the United States to talk about why it is we need to incarcerate children, right? So when we talk about manufacturing consent, right, this is a little bit of what it looks like. The manufacturing of consent, right, is working to build people's engagement and even <laughs> embrace of law enforcement. Now, it doesn't just happen right in the realm of policy and politics. It also happens through popular culture, right? Some of y'all are going to be mad at me for this next one. The C-SPAN network's free. Y'all going to go see Bad Boys? Check this out. Come on, my film is I'm in the ginger ale. Get a ginger ale and nothing else. And those dogs fresh for the man yesterday. Give me one, put some relish on that motherfucker. Nobody fresh? Don't like that. <clears throat> that Skittles on the counter, Marcus? That's not mine, Mike. Right? Yes, it is. <laughs> Marcus, get in the car. He has a gun to my head. Want to deal with him? You want to deal with me? Sorry, sir. But I got it. Aren't you the police? Aren't you the police? Again. Small, discursive, almost subliminal. But there's a certain amount of acceptable violence that we're just cool with, right? The fact that the cool renegade cop could just ride through the city doing essentially whatever he wants, right? Just um, hitting all those crazy turns and stuff and um, him essentially being a little coercive to his partner, right? You know, Martin Lawrence. Um, telling him that, hey, you know, you're not supposed to eat those Skittles because you got health conditions and shit, so get your ass in the car. Um, and then subsequently shooting somebody and leaving them there to bleed. Right? But again, this is just what we're supposed to accept. Right? This is what we're supposed to accept. Now, there are other, I mean, millions of other examples of where we watch and consume these ideas of the ubiquitous sort of understanding and engagement that law enforcement can and quite frankly should do whatever in order to keep us safe, even if it comes at our own detriment, right? And this creates the conditions that I call carceral common sense, right? So 
Why does this graphic exist? Why does it exist? Right? Why in this particular country, right, does it make sense that we spend so much public dollars on one type of social service, i.e. incarceration, and not enough public dollars on another one? Right? Why? So I define carceral common sense as the state manufactured consent to remove social welfare and life sustaining programs in order to institute a state of mass incarceration and social control. Carceral common sense facilitated by the state's hegemonic monopoly on violence creates the conditions to build and animate state resources to control racialized communities, right? So carceral common sense is this idea or this, or this perpetuation that this should be normal, right? Now, what does this actually look like? Let's walk through some lessons, right? And some things that, that happen in Los Angeles that are connected to this carceral common sense, right? Let's, let's talk about some concrete examples here. First and foremost, the cost of punishment. What about that? What is it? Right? So let's talk about LAUSD. Between 2011 and 2019, the Los Angeles Unified School District had a 906% increase in I-STAR related incidents. Now, I-STAR related incidents are incidents that are directly connected to mental health and or counseling related causes. So let's say, for example, these are things where there might be patterns of abuse or maybe um, young people might be suicidal, right? Or maybe, um, you know, drugs were found on a particular student, right? So there was a 906% increase in these incidents that necessitate some kind of, you know, behavioral intervention or at least some type of engagement to figure out what's going on, right? Now, in that same time and a little bit before it, there was an 18% decrease in the overall population of students. So in that same time frame, there were 130,000 less students in LAUSD because a lot of folks are getting pushed out by gentrification, right? Now, with both of these things, an increase in counseling-related incidents, and a decrease in the overall population, how does school police budget go up? That's that carceral common sense. Because we got to figure out a way to control these kids who's going through all these things. And that mechanism for control, law enforcement. Now, what does that look like to these young people? This is data from a participatory action research project, the Brother Sun Sales Coalition Safety and Youth Justice Survey. Uriel actually worked on this survey. Um, so we work with nine community-based organizations, um, and we collaboratively, we surveyed 3,378 young people to figure out how it is they wanted to invest in their city, and what are some of the things that they saw and witnessed, right? And one of those questions that they asked was, have you ever been harmed by law enforcement? This is a breakdown of how some of those young people have been harmed by law enforcement. Even though Black youth were 16% of our survey, they were 37.9% of all the young people harmed by law enforcement. More than one out of three are 39% of the youth who were harmed by law enforcement reported never having been arrested or officially detained. Well, these are people who just getting their ass whooped just because, right? Now, again, at the Brothers Sun Sales Coalition is primarily um, um, a group that's for masculine-identified youth or masculine of center youth, right? So this isn't just cisgender boys. This also includes, right, trans youth. This also includes gender nonconforming youth, et cetera. Right, and they wanted to figure out what was going on, right, when we broke these things down by gender. And one of the things that we found was one out of every four of the people who were harmed by law enforcement were women or femme, right? And 25% of the young people who were harmed, again, one out of every four are LGBTQ. 
So we take an intersectional look at this, right? Police are whooping everybody's ass. Right? So what does this actually feel like? It's my little homie Aiden. And in an interview with Aiden, I had asked him, or we were talking a little bit about his school. And Aiden was talking um, more broadly about, um, you know, policing and police presence on his campus, right? And Aiden had said that nobody likes police. And he said, um, mostly because I think of the way they make us feel. Because the um because the school grounds, you're just walking around looking, looking at random kids and staring them down. For some reason, it just leaves tension in the air. It was this one time in the ninth grade where there was a fight at um at school after school. And instead of breaking up the fight like a regular person, they would just spray their pepper spray in the air and it got it in a whole bunch of people's eyes. So you see a couple of kids fighting. The immediate instinct is not to, hey, y'all, chill out. Nah, the immediate instinct is to hit the whole crowd with pepper spray. Really? But again, these are the conditions, right, that carceral common sense creates. Now, I don't want to just talk to y'all about those conditions because even though it's real, people are doing shit about it, right? So what is to be done? And this is where abolitionist organizing the challenge, carceral common sense comes into play. So what is abolition, right? This is um, a community organizer, scholar, writer, and all right, Miriam Kaba. Um, if you don't know who Miriam Kaba is, you need to learn who Miriam Kaba is because um, she is a boss. Um, and I want to be like her one day. I'm just saying. Um, but Miriam Kaba and Andrea Ritchie in their book, No More Police, go on to say that abolition is about creating real solution to the violence produced by organized abandonment and organized violence through a multitude of resources and services rather than a single response designed to contain, control, and kill. Right? So in this book, one of the things that they do um, while also spelling out the fact that like eh, policing is trash is right they articulate that policing has become the stand-in for every single social issue that currently exists in our society right so if there's somebody's having a mental health episode call the cops right domestic violence situation call the cops my cat ran away call the cops Right? It, 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 it's, it has become the stand in for everything. Right? So, what they articulate in the book is that for every one of these situations, we need to be articulating and designing and creating another type of resource, right? That is meant to serve communities as well as meant to um, be a life sustaining resource as opposed to one that um, controls and kills. Right? So this can be articulated in two different ways. The first is dismantling the carceral state. So stripping police and prison power, um, demilitarizing police, ending surveillance, shrinking and eliminating police budgets, and then ending policing and carceral culture. Now that last one is important because everybody who does policing ain't cops, right? Sometimes it's teachers. Sometimes it's doctors. Sometimes it's social workers. Right? So everybody who does policing ain't cops. But when we're talking about abolition, right, it's about addressing all of these things. So us working to eliminate willful defiant school suspensions, where kids are over here being suspended for sagging pants or chewing their gum, right, is a part of a larger abolitionist project. Right? Second, rebuilding a state of care. So that includes creating alternative systems of care. Right, so that way we're not just only investing in one particular way. Building systems of youth development, right? At one point in time um, in the city of Los Angeles, and even to this day, <laughs> we spend more money on animal control than we do young people. Damn, right? So uh, some people I'm assuming have seen Friday, right? I've seen that movie Friday. 
So uh, Craig's dad was a dog catcher, right? Um, his department got more money than the department he developed in the city of Los Angeles, not the county, the city. Wow, right? So making sure that we're building systems to actually support and invest in young people, growing crisis intervention, right? To make sure that we have systems in place, right? To be able to check in when there is a crisis, right? Developing housing for all, right? Cause I mean, this is a basic human right. Like, yo, people should have a place to stay, especially in this capitalist place where we have 10 empty homes for every single homeless person. And then finally, building a transformative or restorative justice culture, right? So these are some of the central components, right? Of what abolitionist organizing looks like, because it's not all about just burning prisons and getting rid of the police, even though that's a part of it. Um, it's also about rebuilding a state of care. <clears throat> now, what are the types of organizing, right, that are connected to fighting carceral common sense, right? So I break these down in three different categories. There's the campaign intent. So what is the campaign intending to do, right? There's campaign methodology. So how do they actually engage in the organizing itself? And then there's the campaign outcome, right? Now, for the campaign intent, there are different campaigns. And again, these are not static areas, right? You know, these areas are, you know, sometimes they can be fluid, sometimes they can be um, together, right? But I categorize them like this so that way it's easier to follow. So they're information-driven campaigns, right? To help us understand the issues better. There are policy-focused campaigns that are focused on spe changing specific policies or practices in communities. And then there are electoral campaigns, right, to be able to mobilize our democratic process in order to um, turn out the vote. Then when we talk about campaign methodologies, right, um, you have participatory research, right? So that's that action research work I was talking about. Then there's direct action or confrontation. So that can be anything like having a rally to showing up to an elected official's house at five in the morning, right? And trust me, we've done all that shit. Um, <laughs> and then there's getting out the vote, right? So that's connected to the larger electoral strategy. And then the campaign outcomes, they can, we can either move on the invest divest frame. So how do we invest in communities and divest in carceral institutions? Um, do we engage in harm reduction or survival, right? So how is it that we work to reduce the harm that's facilitated by the state or working to build out new mechanisms for survival? Because again, if we're gonna get to a space where we can actually get to abolition, we gotta be here and be alive and shit, right? Um, and then finally, the dismantle, disarm and disempower. So all of these are connected um, to how it is communities have mobilized in order to transform or engage carceral common sense. Now, let's talk a little bit about what this looks like in the concrete and move a little bit out of the abstract. So um, this is a part of LA's movement to reimagine public safety through the people's budget. So I'm a part of an initiative with Black Lives Matter in LA um, called the People's Budget LA Coalition. Right. And with the people's budget, um, we did work to survey community members to figure out how it is they want to invest public dollars. Now, this people's budget survey was created by community members, community members in different town halls. Right. Were the ones to say, hey, we want to ask other people this. We want to ask other people that over 3000 people were engaged to help create the people's budget survey. And from that. Right. That's how we develop the survey tool that we then disperse to communities, right? So this is a quick snippet of that particular movement, and this is from uh, 2020. Check this out. All of us are here because we want a better Los Angeles and a better world. This is a moment where the world has cracked open, and you all have the opportunity to really be courageous into something different in the city of Los Angeles. And we see different things happening throughout the country and throughout the world. And then we get this mayor's budget in the midst of a health pandemic with an economic fallout where he's increasing the LAPD budget. So at the time that we are dying the most, the budget reflects the least resources 
in communities that are dying. Overwhelmingly, the call was that we wanted to invest in universal means and divest the traditional forms of police. What would it look like if instead of law enforcement shooting people with rubber bullets and tanks, we used some of that money, right, and we used it to invest and the protective equipment for our city workers and the protective equipment of the essential workers who are on the front line, what would it look like if we had that type of infrastructure already in place? Well, now is the time to be bold. Excuse me in that photo yard, that video, I hadn't had a haircut in like three months. Remember, it was a peak COVID, you know what I'm saying? So the struggle was real. <laughs> really want to implore that we do differently. There are so many children here that are going to remember what happened in this crisis and how our leaders chose to act. We're going to stop it there because we got to get on to the next piece. But again, we had surveyed 24,000 um, folks in Los Angeles to figure out what it is that they wanted to invest in, right? And then we presented that to city council. Now, a lot of folks will tell you, oh, well, the movement wasn't successful or they didn't actually do anything real. Well, um, we'll figure out what happens next. So, um, I'll let the uh, hegemonic mass media tell you what's up. Black Lives Matter presented its people's budget to the LA City Council as it pushes for police reform. They want the city to allocate about 6% of the city's budget to law enforcement and policing. Right now, the city earmarks more than half to law enforcement. BLM's people's budget calls for more money to go toward community services, mental health, and what it calls other human-centered services. We don't want to have to constantly hold your feet to the fire. What we would love is for you to step out, be bold, be courageous. And across the state, three major California police unions, the LA Police Protective League and the San Jose and San Francisco Police Associations, have joined forces in a call for policing reforms. Now, that was so disingenuous, but it's okay. We're going to get to the next one. Check this out. The L.A. City Council has taken its first step in defunding the LAPD. Today, the council voted to cut the budget by $150 million. CBS 2's Dave Lopez takes a look at how the cut affects the department. The edict from LAPD Chief Michael Moore, from now until the new fiscal year of July 1st, no more overtime for anyone in the LAPD. And today, that new proposed budget took a hit. You now. I show you this first and foremost. Again, $150 million is a drop in a bucket for a $3 billion police department, right? Again, they didn't have overtime for about two weeks. <laughs> no, literally, like this happened June 15th. They voted June 16th. Um, and then until July 1st, they didn't have overtime. <laughs> two weeks of overtime is $150 million? That is insane. That is insane, but that's American police, right? But I wanted to show you this because first and foremost, you know, we did get a little win out of this, right? Um, and second, um, this was rooted in a particular time where the political will for that um, was palpable. The LA State uh, Council of this is from the most recent People's Budget Survey, where we presented this to Mayor Karen Bass um, this past February. And as you can see, what the people want to invest in, right, are housing security, which is this top one up here. They want to invest in public health and health care, right? They want to invest in mental health and wellness, right? They want to invest in public transportation. They want to invest in parks and recreation. Everything over here, right, is above 60%, right? Even the fire department is above 60%, right? You never hear a song saying F the fire department, right? <laughs> but when you look down here, um, policing, the city attorney's office, and parking enforcement, um, people ain't really vibing with those, especially parking enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> Found that interesting, right? Um, but again, when we talk about what it means to make uh, public investments, as well as what it means to actually check in with your community to see where it is they want to put their money, right? This is what that looks like, right? And this is from our most our, rec our most recent iteration of the People's Budget Survey, where we got about sixteen hundred survey results. Now, this is from an electoral participatory research campaign 
right, to get out the vote and invest, right? This is a Measure GG campaign. Um, so Measure GG in the city of Inglewood was the first organizing campaign I was ever a part of as a community organizer. And um, young people in the Black Male Youth Academy, which was a program of the Social Justice Learning Institute, uh, had surveyed folks in their community to figure out how it is they want to invest in school resources, right? And what they did was they took these survey results to city council, they took the survey results to the Inglewood Unified School District, and they got a bond measure put on the ballot called Measure GG. Measure GG was a measure that was going to increase sales and property taxes in the city of Inglewood by a marginal percentage was going to generate $90 million to invest in Inglewood schools, particularly to invest in Inglewood school infrastructure. Right? Now, while everybody else is trying to reelect Obama, in that time, right? Um, and this is 2012. Um, these young folks were trying to get more money and resources for their schools. And they got 87% of the people in the city of Inglewood to vote yes to increase their own taxes to invest in Inglewood schools, right? These black boys who were pushed out by that same school system, these black boys who were in a school system that has disdain for them fought to invest in it. Damn, that's crazy, right? It's my little homie TK, right? Um, or Ty King Brown. I guess he ain't a little no more. He a grown ass man now. Um, <laughs> but uh, TK, in an interview, I was talking to him about his experiences, and this is what he had to say, right? TK said, "I remember one day we gave a speech at the school board, and they gave us a standing ovation." Um, he said they were talking about. I'm about to cry right now because again he was emotional when he was thinking about it. Um, they were talking about how they had never seen a group of, of, of our backgrounds, right? Again, all Black boys and um, young men, 47% uh, of whom were systems impacted, um, so had been arrested before, um, come together and be able to share what we really think. And it wasn't nothing Scorza wrote. Scorza was their executive director at the time, right? You know, it wasn't no fake script or nothing like that. It was like, we care. You get me as touching because, like, I was a part of that movement. You know, so he's talking about the power, right, that comes from action research and being able to transform a material condition, right? Schools were rebuilt because of this, right? Schools were rebuilt. And the irony is that <laughs> schools were rebuilt are now being closed down. Mm -hmm. Damn, right? Damn. So still got to contend with the state. Now, finally, um, when we talk about campaigns for abolition, we're also looking at information-driven campaigns, right? So direct action campaigns, right, that are policy-focused to invest and divest. And this is from the Police Free Schools Movement. So I'm going to show you this that one of our foundation partners had made um, so that we can get a sense of the longevity, right, that these type of movements are supposed to have. Because, again, you're not just going to walk out one day and then go get a win. It takes time, right? So check this out. Um,
So again, right, you see the consistency, the momentum that it took, right, in order to actually get to a school police mm -hmm. cut, right? We didn't go straight from super conservative district to defunding police. No, it took years to build that momentum, right? Um, and not only just the direct action campaigns, oh, but no. also action research, right? So the Brother Son Sales Coalition, again, that survey I told y'all about where we surveyed 3,300 students, right? Like um, the black students in that survey, 73% 70, of them said that they find police overly aggressive. And this is one of the data points that was used in speeches um, where young people were giving testimony as to why the school police should be defunded. In addition to that, Students Deserve, another organization that has been the anchor for a lot of our police free schools work in Los Angeles, right? They did a survey on what it is they, that um, we should be investing in. 58% of young people said grief counselors, 69% said extra studies, 72% said smaller classes, and 79% said um, full time psychiatric social workers, right? So we see what it is people want to invest in, we see what they want to do, right? Again, action research is not just about going to get this data for data's sake. It's about mobilizing it and building campaigns to build power, right? Building campaigns to transform material conditions. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of notes. First and foremost, right, that we have to engage in, in actions called non-reformist reforms, right? I know y'all are like, what the hell is a non-reformist reform? This doesn't even make sense. Well, let's break it down real quick. This is from... Amna Akbar, um, she's a, a professor out at um, Ohio State University, a law professor, right? So non-reformist reforms aim to undermine the prevailing political, economic, social order, construct an, an, an essentially different one, and build democratic power towards emancipatory horizons. They seek to redistribute power and reconstitute who governs and how. Today's thinking about non-reformist reforms is both an effort to rethink the kinds of laws, policies, norms, relationships, and modes of organization that we might build to govern society and an effort to democratize relations of power to have fundamentally different people at the helm, right? Now, when we're talking about fundamentally different people, we're not just talking about, you know, going out to go elect a whole bunch of, you know, people of color who are liberals and shit. Like, no, that's, that, that, that's not the idea. Right. The idea is how do we work to ensure that communities are at the table? How do we work to ensure that communities um, are always not only a part of the decision making process, but a part of the larger transformation process? Now, that school police budget um, situation where we cut um, the school police budget by 35 percent and reinvested that in the black student achievement. Now, it's not like we just trusted the district to do that. Nah, we built out a black student achievement plan that was written by the community. Not only did we build that out, but we also built in a BSAP, which is the acronym for black student achievement, um, a BSAP steering committee that is made up of community organizations, right? So we're not just gonna trust these folks to go do this shit on their own. No, nah, we gotta have community input. There has to be community input and not just community input, but community direction. Right. So when we talk about this idea of non-reformist reforms, right, it, and we talk about building systems, building ways to democratize power, right, that's what that looks like. And some other notes, right, I want to leave you with. Investment without an analysis of racial capitalism is incomplete. We saw that with the Inglewood Unified School District where we were able to get money to invest in schools, right, and to rebuild schools, 
But without the larger analysis of racial capitalism and the district's fiscal issues at that time, and then how those fiscal issues led to a state takeover, which has led to all the austerity that has pushed people out of the district, and now they're closing the same schools that we just rebuilt. If we don't have an analysis of racial capitalism, we are going to make mistakes. And I'm telling you all this from real experience, right, as opposed to telling you this right in theory now this is stuff that we actually worked on actually organized the brain right second abolitionist movements are focused on both addressing the conditions that create um and our reactions to violence they are not in and of themselves going to single-handedly stop all violence right we're not going to get rid of murder and violence tomorrow right even if we take every single dollar that goes to our carceral system and reinvest it, right? We are not going to eradicate all violence immediately. It is going to take, it is going to take time. It is going to be a process. Again, this system of white supremacist settler colonial violence, right? That communities across the globe, the, the, the global people of color majority have been subjected to, right? Was built over 500 years. So it's going to take us some time not only to dismantle that, but also to dismantle the conditions that create the conditions that allow for that intracommunal violence to happen, right? And also to heal from the traumas, right, that facilitate it. So it's going to take some time. But, right, working on abolition is not just about, like, working to try to stop all violence tomorrow. It's about how do we have new ways to address violence? And finally, what does safety look like without structural violence, dispossession, and control, right? So how do we build safe communities um, for folks that don't rely on violence, that don't rely on the dispossession and dehumanization of others, right? That's a critical question that we all must ask ourselves, where we're seeing these examples now in all kinds of different places. We're seeing it in Gaza, right, right now. We're seeing it in the Congo right now. We're seeing it, right, in other places, right, where communities are, because somebody doesn't feel safe, other groups are being subjected to large amounts of violence. So when we want to build an abolitionist world, how do we build a world where people are safe without violence as the, as the answer? So with that being said, that's my presentation. I'm going to contact info. And I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but if we do, uh, I'll well, let you maybe, know. I don't know what the appetite for questions is, but maybe we can take one or two questions and then we can shift to a less formal mode of socializing. You can hang out for a second and just sort of chit chat. Okay. But I think maybe we give one or two people a chance to answer questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was like, yeah, like I'm really grateful that you're here. Um, I really appreciate it a bit. Um, my question is, I really found uh, your and Leo's work around the community engaged versus um, community rooted. Community rooted. It's like yeah. a really excellent, really helpful framework. Uh, before that slide, you had said something about um, problem solving versus problem posing. And my question to you is, what do you think like gets uh, challenging for academics, researchers, in uh, moving up from an orientation of problem posing? Mm, absolutely. Um, so I like to go back to this one article again. This is where you know being interdisciplinary helps, right? Um, Danny Solorzano and um, Dolores Delgado Bernal um, wrote this article on transformative resistance um, back in 2001 and like hit the education world by storm, right? Um, and they drew this axis. Um, let's see if I could uh, pop on the um, here and get in my professor bag real quick. Um, they drew this axis to be able to um, identify different relationships of not only power, but how young people were motivated, right, to engage in certain things. So at the top, we have a critique of structural oppression. 
uh, I would just put OPP because we're not going to do all that right now. Right? Over here, we have motivated by social justice. Over here, um, we have uh, I think this was either not motivated or reactionary, one of those, right? I'm trying to remember these two. Um, but essentially, right, I think this one was not motivated, right? And this was sort of like reactionary, if I'm not mistaken. Or these could be switched. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to remember the article. I haven't read it since my qualifying exam, right? <laughs> um, now, um, when thinking about uh, the ways how people are trying to be engaged in different projects, right? Um, they oftentimes end up over here somewhere, right? Where they're reacting to a particular problem, but, and, and they're motivated by social justice, so they wanna do right, right? But they don't have a critique of oppression, right? So this ends up being what the um, um, uh, uh, names, so those known for now, what they call conformist resistance, right? Or essentially them being brought into a broader state project um, that is supportive of and essentially works to fortify the state, right? Um, now those problem posing questions are typically rooted up here, right? And this is what they call transformational resistance, right? And in this idea of transformational resistance, um, they're both motivated by social justice and they have a critique of social oppression. So think of this as you know, when a young person is being wronged by a school, instead of them not being motivated by social justice and having a critique, where instead of them saying like, well, forget this, it's not like the school is gonna do anything for me, I'm gonna drop out, right? Now, they go and they organize walkouts, right? They go and they start a, a BSU or something, right? Um, in order to engage their conditions. So um, when we talk about that piece around problem posing and problem solving, right? Again, a lot of people are motivated by social justice to do the right thing, but they don't have a critique of oppression, right? And because they don't have a critique of oppression, they end up doing silly shit that just continues to fortify the state and continues to fortify relationships of power. So it's important to have that critique of oppression. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, for sure. I want to make sure that was helpful because. Uh, again, I think bring, introducing a whole new idea and shit. Just want to make sure it works. Yeah, for sure. Another question? See? Yes. Okay. One presentation. Um, I had a question specifically about uh, people's budget survey. So, an yes. uh, organization that I work for uh, called Black Owned Toys, uh, we are actually embarking upon uh, having our own survey that talk about that, you know, basically collect uh, information from Black women and families from 2 to 8 to 18 to 25. Mm -hmm. One of the um, uh, resistances that I'm meeting with some of the leadership is this idea of you know putting out the survey and having people take it. And I was just curious to hear um, what have been some of your strategies in terms of getting people to like you know take the survey because there's some folks that's like this survey, nah, y'all might be the ops. I ain't trying to like you know take it. So I was you know curious like you know how did you get uh, you know that many people uh, willing to give money and more. Mm, that is a great, excellent question. Um, now I'm gonna tell you, like I tell all my all my little homies and everybody else, organizing is ninety percent relationships, yeah. right? So it don't matter, right? How cold your strategy is, how clean your survey is, right? What your political analysis is, you might be the sharpest, smartest you might actually have the answer, right, to end all systemic oppression. You might have it, right? But if you don't have relationships with people, don't, none of that shit matter, right? So you have to be able to distribute 
your survey through those networks of people with which you have relationships with, right? So first and foremost, right, um, do you have a team of young people who are working um, to distribute this survey, right? And do they have ideas about outreach and engagement, right? Um, have they been trained or been engaged in what, you know, base building strategies look like, right? Um, are there ways, right, that we can think about um, not only incentivizing the survey, but also using our relationships in order to, to, to move the survey forward. I have some community organizers in this room, right? So some of y'all may, may or may not be familiar with the snowflake method, right? Uh -huh. Right? Right now. See, I mean, you know, I've been outside, right? Uh, so again, right, as, a, as an organizer, right, you know, one of the things that we think about um, are our core relationships, right? So let's say, for example, I got five homies, right? And I know for a fact that these five homies, right, I know and trust I can cultivate like I can cultivate their related their 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 leadership around this particular survey, right? Now, right, what we do with this snowflake method is each one of my five homies got three other homies, right? And can we build their relate their leadership enough, right, to where they can engage those three homies about something else? And then each one of those three homies got another three homies, right? So can we cultivate their like again, right, through through networking through those relationships? Can we continue to cultivate those those um, that leadership enough to where we can then spread particular information? We can spread ideas. We can build power around our campaigns enough in order to get the goals that we're trying to meet, right? Um, now, again, this is just one small base building strategy, right? Like this is not the end all be all. This is a, used um, a lot in different get out the vote campaigns, right? But um, when you're talking about doing something like a survey because they're they have a concrete deliverable, that's like one of those things you might want to think about. So, in terms of survey distribution. Right, that's one thing. Another thing you might want to think about is, are there other organizations who might also be interested in this data, right? Um, and then, right, like if you if this survey is funded from a foundation or something like that, is there a way that you can kick that organization a little bit of change to also um, to also go and like collect surveys? So with the Brother Son Sales Coalition, each group had a goal of 225 surveys that they were supposed to collect as their organization and they could do that however they saw fit, right? Um, so if you are doing this in coalition as opposed to just doing it in one organization, that could potentially expand your reach, right? And finally, um, what are some of the other areas where, um, again, these are like Gen Z age, black women are young black women, you said 18 to 25, right? Yeah. Um, who are being targeted for this survey. So where are they hanging out? Uh, what organizations have access to this particular base? And is there a way that you can cultivate a relationship with them to be able to spread the survey? So think about like divine nine groups, think about like, um, you know, the different campus groups, because again, black women are the largest constituency of the Democratic Party. And we're talking about voting, right? Like this is the time to engage them. So could be a thing. Let's say this. Uh, we should ship. I hope that wasn't permanent. No, it's dry erase. Okay, we can. So uh, I think first we should thank Dr. Turner for his talk. We didn't get a chance to ask your question. We're going to stay in this room and also outside here. We're going to socialize. There's refreshments here. And um, we could talk in like a more casual setting. If you're with the workshop, our next scheduled thing will be a ride back to the hotel at 4 30 downstairs. Okay? Thank well, we you. We got dropped off. Oh, say again, Same spot where we got dropped off. So same spot. Same spot at 4 30. Okay. And again, thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>